my bag is like uh, I even got Zoe's bread in here. Huh? I got your bread. <gasps> my bread. She bought bread I brought, from me. I brought your China. Oh really? Yeah. I even brought the Thank paper you. bag oh so that god. it looks good. Oh my god. You gonna give me the bread now? I'm an alcoholic. This <laughs> 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 is gay conversion therapy. <laughs> no, for real. I my pronouns are. We're supposed to introduce name, pronouns, and sexual orientation, correct? Yes, we don't assume. I understand. Okay. Um, all right. Um, hi, my name is Zoe. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a lesbian. <laughs> what? What's so funny about that? She's not. Ha lesbian. Um, I don't know. It feels like an AA thing. <laughs> it's like, hey, I mean, uh, this for X years. Uh, hi, my name is Faye. I'm 25 and I'm also a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> you see how it sounds? <laughs> <laughs> I know one, anyone or someone who wants to share what your experience and journey as you identify them. How's your experience and journey so far as a LGBT person in the community? Hmm. Is, this is quite a general yeah, question. Yeah, I don't know what to start off. Yeah. So, we're going to answer generally. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess for me, it's like my journey was basically um, growing up, I actually didn't know that I was queer. Um, and for me, it was very confusing because it affected the way I expressed myself. And what I realized is that, you know, um, when I was a kid, I expressed myself very differently, whereby I wasn't like other girls. I wasn't normal, you know, I expressed myself in a more masculine manner. And I think in that sense, it kind of made me the weird kid, right? Because, I mean, it was more prominent in secondary school because that's when our bodies start developing and all of that. So I think that made me the weird kid. And growing up, I didn't even realize there was such a thing called bisexual or lesbian, you know? So um, when I started to figure that out, I was kind of like, oh, maybe I'm bisexual, right? But in a sense that like, because of the way I express myself, I kind of got singled out, you know? After I, you know, because I'm a lesbian now, so I thought I was bisexual, but it took me a lot to get to a place where I finally accepted the fact that I was a lesbian because of compulsory heterosexuality, right? So, yeah, I think it took a lot of reading and a lot of my friends saying, I don't see you with men, Zoe, blah, 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 blah. Only for me to be like, okay, yeah, maybe I am a lesbian. And it also took a lot of like, you know, I had to sleep with a man to find out that I was a lesbian, you know? So I think in terms of um, that, in terms of like safety and everything, I would consider myself to be one of the most privileged demographics within the queer community. I think that's that lah. <coughs> What does that mean? Yeah. Okay, um, so the thing is that like, of course, you know, that like queer people, there's a lot of variety of queer people, right? So first of all, I'm not under the share at all. So I am, yeah, I'm a lot safer. Secondly, I'm a woman. So if you know, like, at least for gay men, there are a lot more, there's a lot more hatred towards them because of, you know, fragile masculinity and everything, right? So they normally don't take suffix or lesbians seriously. They don't take women seriously in that sense, you know, they think like, oh, it's just play play only ma. You know, and a lot of times people like to sexualize queer women. So that's why there's not as much danger towards us because they're like, oh, it's okay. In comparison to if they see a man and a man holding hands, they'll be like, ew, right? So yeah, in that sense, I'm a lot more safer. Yeah. No problem. No. <laughs> <I'm staring at laughs> ain't, ain't nobody sharing? <laughs> the fuck? Okay, fine, I'll, I'll share. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Okay. Damn. Uh, for me, it's <coughs> mostly like, okay, so I always knew that I was gay since I was a kid. Because I think as a kid, I was like, oh, there are some girls that are like my friends, but some girls that I like, but I cannot explain what that means. And also as a kid, you don't really understand sex, at least for me. I don't know like what sexual attraction is and all that. I just know that I like them in a way that's different from like other girls who are my friends. Like I always want to be with them, want to hold their hands, want to like play with them. You know, but yeah, I just didn't really know that. And I think I've always like, um, yeah, I've always had that feeling up until like I understood what religion and hell meant. And so then that changed a lot of my perspective because like mm. of the same reason, compulsory heterosexuality. 
And also like when you're young, like you don't really have a lot of education on like gender and sex and like sexuality. So I thought I was trans. So I thought like, oh, I had to be a boy to like a girl because yeah. I like girls. Correct. But it wasn't until I discovered that you can be a lesbian. So there's that. Mm. Was it also like um, secondary school? Yeah, that was secondary school when you were like more on the internet. Like I think the first way I discovered it was uh, mm. LGBT. Like, you know, like on Ask FM, like people like to say like, oh, are you LGBT? Are you? And I was like, why do I keep seeing this acronym everywhere? Then I was like Googling, I was like, oh, it's then. Exposure that kind of helped, like, <coughs> yeah. But I knew about transgender since very young. Like, because I think it's very common in Southeast Asia. So you will say, I mean, like, these are not politically correct terms, but things like lady man, like, you know, or tomboy, like, all these kind of things. So you would think that, or people can change their gender expression, but obviously it's just not limited to two, but that's how you're exposed to, like, when you're growing mm. up. And so that was the case. And then, even though I learned what, like, being queer means, then suddenly it had a meaning to it, which is wrong by, like, you know, religion and everything. And also because my parents were Christian, so I grew up, like, in a Christian household mm. and... Pastors would be very, you know, like, oh, it's wrong, it's, like, bad and everything. And, you know, it's, like, um, basically anybody who identifies as such, they go to hell. And mm. and also, uh, this is a choice. It's, yeah. like, something that you can actively choose because it's considered, like, lust. So, yeah. hence, you need, like, conversion therapy for it because, mm. like, it is a mental illness. And people tend to, like, perpetrate that kind of idea. So, yeah. then I was, like, yeah, maybe I'm not that... Mm. Then I just like dissociated from it and I was like, I was just trying very hard to be straight and I couldn't even identify as bisexual because like to me, okay, it doesn't matter if you're still like men, like it's still wrong. So it's like, I just like exclusively said like I was straight, I was straight until like I got to college and I was like away from my parents. And then that was when I was like, yeah, maybe it's like, it's okay for me to like loosen up. And also because like in college, I started taking more religion classes. And then I just learned that, you know, it's really very man-made and very up to uh, human interpretation. But also because I, I realized I don't really want to subscribe to it anymore. And that was when I was like, I'm comfortable with identifying as queer because like, I realized that I don't actually believe in the religion. So there's not that afterthought of like hell, 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 like looming over your head. So yeah, then afterwards I slowly like realized, you know, I was not bisexual, that I was a lesbian and it was just like all calm head. Yeah. But yeah. Mm. So what she was mentioning, it seems like it's a journey, right? So yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Mm. It really sounds like AA. Every time someone answers, like clap. Uh, okay, is it my turn? Yeah. Um. Okay. So for me, okay. Of course, at first I came out as bisexual because uh, that's what I thought it was. So the thing about me is that yeah, I grew up in a very like conservative family as well. I think similar to two of you, right? My family was very very Christian. So, um, in my head all the time, I would always say, I would always think like, oh, being gay is wrong, being gay is wrong. But actually, the only, when I started to think it was wrong was when I went to a Christian school. That was when I started taking it more seriously, like, oh shit, I'm actually bisexual, you know, it's, it's something serious. Because before that, I was like, just like, whatever, you know. So then, I started to suppress it a lot more, and that was when I felt the need to maybe come out in the future. Because there was the whole thing about suppressing it, right? And then um, I think during that time, you know, when I came out to my friends, it was basically because I decided to say, you know, like, fuck it to religion, right? I was like, I don't want to deal with this shit. <clears throat> Why do I have to hide who I am? So I came out to my friends and because my environment was very um, conservative, very Christian, very, very, very Christian, I was surprised that 60%, around 60-70% of the people I came out to were okay with it lah. They didn't exactly support it. Um, before that, I did like, you know, what do you call it? Um, I tested the waters, you know, I asked my teachers in the Christian school like, oh, what do you think of gay people? You know, and they'd be like, they would tell me like, oh, Ellen is funny, but I don't agree with her lifestyle. Or I asked my friends, you know, they would be like, I don't like the idea of them existing and all of that, you know. So that was my entire environment. Um, but I still came out to them anyway because I just didn't want to hide lah, right? Um, there were some people who were like, yeah, it's okay, you know, we still love you anyway, we don't agree with it, but you know, you are still my friend regardless, you know? And you know my viewpoints on this, but I'm your friend first and foremost. But there have also been some friends who were like, um, telling me to sit down with a pastor, with a therapist, and with my parents because it's wrong, right? You're not supposed to be like that. I also had a friend who blocked me on social media, <laughs> on all social media platforms just because I was like, oh, I'm bisexual. 
you know, there'd be a lot of people, not a lot lah, a certain group of people who would try to tell me that, no, you're straight, you know, don't think like that, you just haven't met the right man, you know, that has made you feel some type of way, you know. So that was like my friends during that point in time. Then coming out to my parents, so I did try to come out to my mom twice. I failed both times. <clears throat> the first time was basically, it was during that period of time where I was not very confident in my sexual orientation, but I wanted to tell someone because I wanted to know that my parents would accept me regardless. I sat down with my mom and I cried for two hours in front of her and I couldn't spit it out. You know, so that was the first time I tried coming out to my mom. Second time was a stupid story. So basically in high school, we have prom, right? <laughs> then I asked, I asked a girl to be my date to the prom. So I sat my mom down. I used that to try and come out to her. I was like, um, so I actually asked this girl to prom. I want to know if you're okay with it. I don't know if she was in denial or the point completely flew over her head. She responded with, no, it's okay, prom is completely fine. It's like a time for you and your friends to have fun, you know. So I think, I think she was either in denial or the point flew over her head. So I never really got to come out to my mom. But for my dad, I mean, surprisingly lah, because I mean, my family is very conservative, but he was, I would say he's accepting of me, you know, because um, the time when I came out was basically after my first serious a lesbian relationship with a woman so I mean obviously I think he suspected because I never bring anyone home that often so I think he suspected but basically how I came out to him it was a very casual way basically it was after the breakup with my ex during that time and my ex was doing a lot of like petty things towards me lah we're not gonna get into that but basically <laughs> basically uh, she tried to hack into my businesses and ruin my career so my dad texted me he was like what time are you coming home and I was like, I'm going to be home really late because somebody threatened to ruin my career and I need to, you know, put out some fires lah. And then he was like, who is doing that to you? And I said, my ex. And he was like, ex what? I'm like, what do you mean ex what? <laughs> and then he was like, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, ex-staff. So he kind of suspected already lah. Then I was like, ex-girlfriend. He was like, oh. <laughs> and then it kind of, the conversation just ended there. And then I think he has been really... I mean, I, I, I'm very grateful lah because, you know, he's very Christian, he's seriously very Christian, he hosts cell group in my house. But he has never once shoved his beliefs down my throat, you know, and he... I even went to him with my previous relationship and asked for relationship advice and he, we ended up talking about religion and he was like, you know, nowadays religion is very accepting of LGBTQ plus people, you know, like, there's always some bad apples within the Christian community, but not everybody is like that. So I think... In comparison to a lot of people, my coming out experience is very safe, very smooth, even though it was <clears throat> very scary to me. I think a lot of it was internalized as well, lah, but you know, I think my coming out experience was very, very safe compared to a lot of people. Yeah. Mm. Well, one clap for me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, my coming out story. Actually, you were my inspiration. <laughs> Because we were in the same friend group. And then, I still remember this was at Pavilion. One day, we were sitting down together and then you suddenly say you're bisexual. Then, I was like, oh, by the way, do you know I also like used to have a crush on a girl? Like, but I said it in a way that was like, you know, it's a phase thing, right? Okay. I remember because you were talking about it, then I was like, shit, there's someone like finally who's gay. I actually always suspected you, but like, I didn't know it was <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, we were in the same friend group and we were, both ended up gay, so it's like, but it was like matching the statistics because they say mm. one in five people yeah. in the friend group is, group gay. is like gay. Like and our friend group was like 10 people, <laughs> so it was like two out of the Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think like for me, like I didn't come out like in the beginning because I was like not very sure. And also like later in college, like even though I was like actively dating women, I didn't come out to any of my friends. I was just like, Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm going on a date. Uh, it was uh, with XYZ. Then they're like, Oh, are you bisexual? Then I'm like, yeah. So I didn't... But at the time, right, it was because I... It's not that I didn't feel the need to come out. It was more like, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. But I didn't want to answer too many questions because like, I haven't figured anything out for myself yet. So I just kind of let it be. It wasn't until like, I really thought about it and I was like, yeah, I'm actually like a lesbian. Like, it's for real. So that, that, that was when I was like... It, it started getting more serious. So then I started feeling the need to actually come out more because I think like part of it was that I was really annoyed that my parents would say shit like 
oh, you know, next time, like, you and your husband, oh, you know, you and your boyfriend. And I just felt very really invalidated. I just felt like, no, there's not going to be any male figure ever, like, do not say that kind of stuff. It makes me feel very invalidated. So I think I felt the urge to come out like when I felt invalidated because I was like, oh my God, is this how people perceive me? Like I don't identify with that and mm. it bothers me because I know some people, they're like okay with it. They can still like play along, but I just felt very like bothered by it. So I was just like, okay, by hook or by crook, I got to come out to them. So I didn't care and I was like, mm. uh, and also like, I was watching one of like the movies where like, you know, uh, you know, they come out to the parents and it was happy ending. And also like you, I was like, you know, I want to believe like my parents are like that. <laughs> then I was like, I'm going to come out of there. So, um, so like, but before I came out, I like prepped myself. Like I was like crying mm. for one hour just to like set the mood and everything. And then afterwards, I was like crying in my room. Then my, my mom was back already. Then she asked me, <laughs> then she asked me, she was like, girl, what's wrong? And then I was like, oh, uh, you and Pa, can you guys like sit at the living hall? Then they're like, okay, okay. Like what was going on? And then afterwards, I sat them down. I was like, okay, sit down. Then I was like crying. I was like, I'm gay. <laughs> that was it. It's like, no further explanation. So then they were like, mm. then they didn't say anything. Then I was like, I, I don't know. I was kind of shocked because I thought like, you know, I was expecting to be disowned. And I, I remember I was calling yeah. you guys. I was like, let me stay at your house if anything yeah. happens. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, yeah, then I came out to them. Then my dad started asking me a lot of questions. He was like, oh, when did you know? How do you know this? And then I was like, Surprisingly, he's very inquisitive and not like, by the way, you're wrong, you know? Mm. I was like, mm. this is a sign I didn't expect of him at all. Then my mom was like, still like, quiet and didn't say shit and anything. Then afterwards, my dad, um, he asked me a lot of questions. Then I just answered and everything. Then he was like, okay, I'm so proud of you. Like, you know, this was a great first step, you know? It's not easy to uh, come to mm. terms with, uh, you know, how you really feel. That's great. So now the next step is therapy. <laughs> and I was like, oh my fucking God. He, the, the point completely like went over his head. So he was like giving me all this. You know, like some people when they talk in like therapy talk. So he was like talking to me like this. So I felt very like validated and I felt because he used all those terms, but actually he was like trying to set the, the, the tone for like conversion therapy suggestion. Then I was like, fuck it, man. Like, but then my mom on the other hand, so she was crying a lot and then she was having a panic attack. And then she was like, actually, I already know you've been gay since like ever. Then I was like, how? And then she was like, oh, pastor at the church told me. And I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> yeah, so he, he knows because like, I mean, for obvious reasons, because my Facebook always had me going to like Pride Parade and mm. at the time I was like butch, so I was like, I look like a boy straight up. So it, it was pretty suggestive. So then he, apparently a year ago before I came out, he mm. told my mom, he was like, oh, your daughter is LGBT by the way, you gotta be careful of her. But then what my mom did was that she actually went to therapy to accept me. So actually like I was very touched by that because like I didn't know that I thought it was just about me, like you were at the moment thinking like oh, it's about me, me, me and everything, but you don't know that sometimes it's kind of um, magical that people also work in their own ways behind the scenes to like meet you there. So my mom was like telling me, she was like, I know you cannot change like who you are. I've known that like a long time ago. And that's why like I took the initiative to take myself to therapy to like meet you halfway and like accept mm. you. Then I was like, oh my God. So it's like, even though the reaction both of them was like very starking, like I wasn't expecting my dad to say that and I wasn't expecting my mom to say that, but like, you know, at least like two thirds accepted me. My brother obviously doesn't give a shit. Like, you know, he's just whoever he is. But yeah, he was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And it was like it lah. So then, yeah, then that was the case. And um, the reason why I wanted to come out to my family was because like, because um, I knew I was like really seriously dating women and I wanted them to hear it from me instead of like someone else. Let's say if they saw me in the street with someone, then they're going to snitch on me. I feel like that would be, that would be a, a bigger issue in a way because mm. like, yeah so once that was done i felt like a lot better like i think after when it was done i felt more like okay i don't really care if my dad accepts me i just want y'all to stop stop saying all these like things about like invalidating my sexuality and all that so yeah so i got that out of the way and i think after that everything like became so much more smooth sailing i felt like even more confident to just be whatever in like work, you know, with friends, with other people, because I just have this whole like fear where like someone's gonna tell my parents, so I need to mm. tell them first. So once I got that out of the way, I was like, that's a lot better. But I know that it also comes from a place of privilege because I do know that people do get this own and people have way more conservative parents. My parents are like, they are Christians and they are conservative, but they are also like the one foot in, one foot out kind. They're like con conservative and religious to their convenience. 
So in a way, I think that also made it a lot easier for me to come out. And also like they, even after all of that, uh, even though my dad didn't accept me, they're like, no, we're not going to kick you out of the house. Like, why would we do that? All that. So I feel like for them, they still have a bit of a humanity, like on top of their beliefs, which is something that I appreciate. Like even if like we're not there yet completely. Yeah. I think with friends and like colleagues and all that, it's just like it happens in conversations. I didn't like really sit anyone down and be like, oh, by the way, like I'm, I'm gay. I think it tends to be more casual, especially people our age. So you don't really have to like explain yourself. Mm. Yeah. So no, I thought this was gonna happen. Yes. We might be late for massage. Uh, then we massage each other. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. okay, we can do it another day. We can do okay, it another okay. day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At least I didn't need to pay. Mm. You know what, we should go to the happy ending one, but don't get happy ending because massage is still good and they're open to like late night one. Okay, I don't know any happy ending. We can. We can. Oh yeah, 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 that's true. Yes. 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 Sorry, uh, just to keep the time. Uh, so we've heard a lot of like, interacting your identity as uh, LGBT uh, uh, in the community uh, and whether there's been like, when they interact with it, has it been Negative, or has there been positive instances as well? Mm. Okay, honestly, obviously, negative instances, right? Well, when, when you mention religion, I don't really ever see a positive effect in terms of like an LGBTQ plus identity because I mean, like you mentioned, like a lot of religious people they preach love and all of that, but you know, they go around spreading hatred towards LGBTQ plus people. It was because of religion actually that I had, I felt the need to suppress my identity and to be very honest, uh, like I mentioned just now when I went to the Christian school, right? You know, the teachers, I had to study religious studies by the way, it was an actual subject, I had to go for an exam for it. You know, I would go to church like really seven days a week, right? And the thing is that like during class in school, the teachers would say things like, you know, uh, the, the United States, you know, legalized same-sex marriage and blah, blah, you know, that's wrong and all of that. And my entire surrounding would be that. And um, one, one of the worst experiences that I had being queer and a Christian at the same time was basically when one of my best friends um, in that Christian school, she came up to me and said that, oh, my mom told me to stay away from you because you might be a lesbian. So that was when, that was like my last straw. I was, you know, I was really taking it seriously, but that was like the thing that really hit me that like, oh, it's, is it really that bad, you know? Because of that, I went into this whole thing where I tried to, DIY gay conversion therapy myself, you know. I read the Bible every night, I prayed every night, I cried every night and I asked like, oh, why, why did you make me like this, God? Why did you make me like this? Like, I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask to be born like this, you know. And the reason why that was so serious to me was because that, like, my thought process was basically if God, which is a higher power, a higher being, that is that supposedly can love everyone but cannot love me or cannot accept me, will my friends love me and accept me? Will my family love me and accept me? Like, who am I to think that they will if even God can't do so? So because of that, it made me feel like I was unlovable, that I was wrong, you know? So that's why I went through the entire process of the DIY gay conversion therapy and all of that, you know? And I think it was a very painful process because there was a lot of internal conflict. There was a lot of self-loathing. There was a lot of self-hatred. And I don't know what happened, but eventually I was kind of like, you know what, screw this shit lah. Yeah, but then at the same time, when I came out as bisexual, right? I tried to make my religion and my sexual orientation work, right? I tried to, I tried to, you know, keep both of it in my life. I tried really, really hard and I, I don't know, I was like doing devotion every morning. I was praying every night before I went to bed. But I think the one thing that made me eventually like really, really stop trying to make both of them work together was basically like when I was in uni, I was in foundation, I was studying foundation. One of my ex high school mates from the Christian school, I saw her posting on Snapchat. She was she she attended a talk in her college, held by the Christian organization in the college, and it was basically talking shit about LGBTQ plus people. It was basically an entire drama just for that. <clears throat> and then I was like thinking like, I was like, you know what? I try really really hard to be a good person. I try really hard to stay faithful to the religion, to stay faithful to God, right? I do everything that I can just to, you know, feel accepted by this community that I really wanted to be a part of, that I really wanted to keep in my life. But at the same time, I try so hard, but these people that I'm trying so hard to be accepted by, 
does not want to accept me regardless. They do not want me in their space. They do not want me in their community. Like they don't even, they just condemn you. Like they don't even welcome you with open arms no matter how hard you try, right? For something that I can't control. And I was kind of like, you know, I, I insert myself in so many spaces where I felt so unsafe, you know, because I would still go to church. I would still do, do this and do that. And I would feel unsafe. I would feel like I had to walk on eggshells. I felt like I couldn't be myself. You know, I felt like if I were to be myself, you know, I would just be condemned lah. So I really suppressed a, part, a big part of myself just to be within that community. I made myself so unsafe in those spaces. They made me feel unsafe in those spaces. And yet I try so hard, but you know, they're not even trying to see me. They're not even trying to empathize with me. They're not trying to accept me, you know. So I was just kind of like, this is when I'm going to slowly start renouncing uh, religion. Um, it took quite a long time because obviously when you grow up in a very Christian family, you have this fear of going to hell. You know, I feel like a lot of um, Christians and a lot of Christian teachings, they, they insert a lot of fear into their teachings to keep you in the religion. And so that took me quite a long time to actually finally say like, I am not a Christian, I'm a free thinker, I don't believe in Christianity. So yeah, I think Christianity and religion has really it's one of the, the most traumatizing things, lah, you know, to have those two in your life at the same time. Yeah. The sort of thing that happens is that you tend to have to renounce the faith. Mm, and yes. I'm have you ever encountered cases where there are queer people that you know that still try to reconcile mm. their um, identity with religion? Have you ever encountered that like, situation? I mean, I do know of people who are both religious and queer I mean not they're not super religious they're more like lukewarm you know they're, they're like yeah one foot in one foot out lah you know and I don't really know their experience with that but from what I realize is that those kind of people who are able to make those two aspects of their life work usually they grow up in families that are not like very up your ass about religion yeah. right their, their parents are more chill you know so what I realized is that those who renounce religion their parents are the most Christiany conservative people ever yeah. Yes, correct, correct. Mm, no problem. It's okay. I pretty much have the same experience as her. So like where I, I also read the whole Bible and I studied religion a lot more than my peers, I'm pretty sure. Because like for me, like at the time, it was a lot more of like a academic interest also like when I was younger in secondary school and then up towards when my college I took a lot of religion classes as well and it was mainly because I wanted to understand it and it came from a place where like I had a lot of disagreements but I felt guilty about having disagreements I have issues with the religion not because of like just the queerness thing the queerness part is just a small aspect to be honest because people are just going to use that one verse from Leviticus they're going to like oh uh, gay people shall be stoned and like call it a day but then actually like the bigger issue I have with the religion is about women like my position as a woman like how I'm perceived and just in general it's a very patriarchal religion and it's also very political it's very violent like a lot of it and I struggle with it because like they will tell you things like oh you know like uh, uh, what is it like you know this is uh, the Old Testament or this is not this is just a man's interpretation they have okay their excuses for all these things are very complicated all the time but for me I'm just like I see it as it is like and you guys follow this book not everyone is gonna like think look at this and be like okay yeah I'm gonna apply some critical thinking from mm -hmm. here because you the way religion is sold to people in general is a very like this is a guide and I think it comforts people in a way because I think yeah it is scary to think about what's gonna happen after you die you're gonna see your loved ones are you gonna be this and that no but here's a book that can like tell you the future you're gonna feel comforted by that so I get it to a certain extent I get why people like turn to religion and everything but for me I struggle with it because there's just like yeah the whole thing about like gender inequality that I struggle with the most and violence in general and also like when I was in like those religion classes I started learning more about how like a lot of the way religion became today is like you know interpretations over the years over like so many years like there are so many missing words and not everybody like truly understands like traditional Hebrew and also like um, they have their own agenda when they interpret like, because it's a big ass book lah. like you know I get it you know like when you read some things you will apply your own biases to it mm -hmm. and a lot of these interpreters are like men you know they uphold values that they want to uphold 
and also like for it to be a very like exclusive religion like oh you must believe in Jesus Christ otherwise like you are going to hell like you know so it, it feels very exclusive and what I learned about it from my classes is that the reason why it became like very monotheistic is because they wanted control over community so they start preaching like Christianity and all these things they actually used to be like a polytheistic religion so people actually believe in multiple gods like you know how we look at Greek gods like this god of this god of that they, it actually used to be like that but like slowly a lot of religions became monotheistic because they want to control over the people so after knowing all of that I'm just like this bullshit like it's just a big ass scam and like I, I feel like I cannot know all these things and still like accept the religion and on top of that the community isn't great either my pastor outed me and I think in general Christians are very nosy I feel like everyone's always trying to like get in people's business and yeah no for real though like they're so like nosy about everything and I feel like why am I always like feeling like this community is trying to be a firestone in my family and the same thing like you you go to church then they'd be like singing praises or preaching love and then afterwards like once service is over then they're just a different person then I'm just like oh my god and then you will hear another excuse for them oh no you know the people does not like reflect the religion I'm like how many excuses am I hearing I keep hearing excuses excuses like it's overall a bad experience I don't want to hear anything anymore and yes I also became traumatized like you because of all these bad experiences and all the excuses that I keep hearing that I was like I'm just going to renounce religion but yeah. the thing is I was actually in a church where they are very very like supportive of queer people so pastors gay you know people are gay it's all like gay Christians everyone is like we're going to like be radical and interpret religion in our own way so we're going to like reclaim like what the religion means but even when I was in there I was just like but why do I need a book to tell me like what's good and bad and I don't like this whole thing where I believe in Jesus like to be safe I just feel like it's very restrictive this like concept of forgiveness and everything because I feel like as humans you need to make mistakes to live and I feel like if a God up there has so much mercy and empathy the God is going to look at my life and understand why I did what I did or like everything I've been through because you know when you watch movies you're like oh the protagonist is kind of like an asshole but like I kind of get it like <laughs> you know you, you have empathy and that's how I imagine like a God would have for me because if I can feel that way for just a TV show I imagine like this superior being if there is one would have that for me as well so that's when I'm just like I, I think I'm unsubscribing because like I just do not yeah I just feel like there's just so yeah I was like <laughs> it's just like a lot of things just didn't make sense to me and I just feel like we're just doing too much having religion I just feel like you, you don't need a book to tell you like what is good or bad you don't need a book you I get it people usually cling on to it because they're scared of life but you are supposed to be scared of life nobody is going to know like not even Christians will know what happens when you die that is the reality you can tell yourself no matter what but all you have to do is just believe that believe that it will all work out for the best like you know yeah that's just how I see it so that's how I ended up renouncing it but it was also because of like the trauma and everything yeah oh yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> so, Can you repeat the question? I, I will forget I every. I will yeah. really forget one. I think I think that for me, I am honestly quite privileged, right? So, um, in terms of accessibility, I okay. Thank you so much. In general, mental health services I feel are not accessible. Whether you're queer, whether you're straight, but if you are queer, it makes it even more inaccessible because you have to worry about finding a safe space, right? I personally have gone to therapy and I still do go to therapy and I would again say that I'm very privileged for that because I get to go to good therapy, you know. And the thing is that it's hard lah because you know when, when people say they can't afford therapy, sometimes I do understand because therapy can be expensive, you know. Sometimes even those more affordable ones affordable ones that are like fifty ringgit, I can understand why it would be expensive or unaffordable for some people. I understand that, you know. Um, and the thing is that when there are good therapists or good clinical psychologists that charge higher, let's say 200, 200 250 around there, like, I don't want to say that they shouldn't charge that also because everybody des deserves to get paid their worth, right? And I can't really say anything about it. Lah. For me, it's like I know what it feels like when a client comes to me and says like, oh, 
can you like reduce the rates? And I don't want to do that to other people, you know. So it's it's really tough because I understand people have you know financial difficulties. I understand that everybody is trying to make a living as well, whether you're a clinical psychologist or a therapist. And I think it all boils down to the government, obviously. And um, I feel like it all should be subsidized by the government, you know, for both parties to be happy, for people to be able to go to therapy, for for therapists to be able to get paid their worth, you know. So I just think that it's it's really hard for. I mean, us to really do anything about it. In terms of queer people, I understand. Okay, I was talking to like a straight friend, right? And she had started going to therapy recently. I think within mid this year. And then she came to me. She has another queer friend, and she talked to her queer friend about me going to therapy. And then her queer friend was like, "Oh, it's good that your friend found a you know a LGBTQ plus friendly uh, you know therapy space, you know, because it's not that easy to find, right?" So I, I guess for queer people, it's also like honestly, everybody's very afraid of getting outed, afraid that oh, what if you know I say this, this, and that to the therapist, and then I suddenly get sent to conversion therapy camp. You know, it's like it's it's tougher for queer people lah. You know, and especially if you don't have that financial stability or financial ability to go for it. So I think in terms of like that safe space and everything for queer people, I just think that for me lah, I'm very very lucky because the first therapist I got was a good therapist. Like she's queer friendly, she's a good therapist. I was able to afford her, so I can say that I'm very lucky. But I don't know, maybe a lot of people out there aren't as lucky, right? So. Um, I feel the same too. I think I've been lucky enough to always find queer affirming therapists. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do admit that like I don't know if they are queer affirming at first. I just kind of go in there and just start talking, mm-hmm. and I think maybe they have no choice but to listen. <laughs> but then again, it's like if if you're not queer for me and your therapist is like, what the hell, right? That was just kind of like my mentality, cause like it should be a place of no judgment, like regardless, and everything. So yeah, but I do think like especially um, because my current therapist, she looks very conservative. She wears a hijab and everything. So when I first met her, I was actually very concerned, and. I, I didn't know what to expect, I was, but I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna go with go into it anyway. But yeah, she's actually the best therapist I've ever had. Like, I I've been seeing her for like three years now, mm-hmm. and she's really great. So I think like for me also one thing is that I shouldn't assume, just because somebody like doesn't look like the demographic that might be accepting, then I would just like feel scared. But then again, like I do understand that. If you are met with a therapist that might seem conservative, then it would actually feel, it would actually feel a bit unsafe. Like, you know, because you don't know them, you just kind of assume and associate people like with what you know. Yeah, but I think like now they've been like a lot of, uh, you know, all these lists where they show you like, oh, okay, queer affirming therapy places and all that. I think like for me, one thing I notice is that Malaysia does have a lot of affordable therapy, which is great, and also they are they seem to be re- run by students, and I assume these students are also queer affirming, considering that they are younger. Yeah, because if they are like let's say an older person, a uh, Gen X or Boomer, then yeah, I'd probably like feel unsafe also like sharing my problems with them, and probably they cannot connect with me the same way. So, but from what I see, like all these spaces, they tend to be the the affordable therapy spaces, lah. They tend to be like uh, dominated by people who are still studying, like the therapists themselves. So, yeah, I I like to think that it's accessible. But then again, like I'm not the one who who like they are catering to as well, because like my current company does provide therapy, so I just use the company's one. Yeah. So. What would an ideal therapist uh, look like to maybe to you, or to, you might generalize it to the people in the community as well? Oh, so basically, like in relation to like queer people being the yeah. clients of the therapist. Okay. Damn, I think my current therapist is the ideal therapist. Same, I think that too. Yeah, she's like perfect, like the best therapist I ever had. Um, I think like for her. Uh, I don't know because like uh, it's very different. She okay, but this is not really related to being queer though. It's just that in general, my experience with therapy is that like I had a few therapists before her, and uh, I always have like attachment issues. With my therapist, so I would always like cry mm-hmm. after every time I had to like say goodbye and everything. Like, but I would return to a, a new therapist for like different reasons. But she's the only one where like I parted ways and I didn't cry with her because I think I learned so I grew so much emotionally when I was with her. 
because uh, I think it's the way that she she teaches me to like compartmentalize my emotions, which may may not be good. I think for some people, but I think it's actually made me like a a lot more aware and a lot more like, um, I would say like calm, like yeah. So and she's also very accepting and like I yeah. She just has like a vibe about her that like makes it a very safe space, and you know she's always uh she's very good with follow ups and she's always like uh she digs more like she really knows how to dig more. She I don't know for some reason like with. With her, she's like the only therapist that I encountered that she asked me things that I never think about before. I think with the previous ones, I kind of can expect what they're gonna ask, but yeah. So yeah. Okay, who's next? You also say she's the ideal therapist. Your oh therapist. yeah, I feel like my my therapist is also the ideal therapist. So my therapist is I don't know she. She makes the environment very like it's very casual, you know. Because obviously, when you first go to therapy, you're like, "Oh my god, I'm talking to a stranger about all my goddamn problems. Like they're gonna hear all my shit," you know. And it's very scary, lah, of course. But then, um, when I went in there, she would like make jokes, and then I'd be crying while laughing at the same time, you know. It's like <laughs> it's a very like nice environment, and I do enjoy the therapy sessions because like there can be fun to it as well, you know. And I think for her, um. You know, I didn't realize. I found out recently that she was actually a Christian. So for me, it was kind of like in the past. Like obviously, when you talk to, you know, somebody, if they like just one on one, let's just say it's outside of a therapy room, right? You would kind of like assume, like, oh, the way you speak, you're gonna be of this religion, you're gonna be like of that background, this background. So when I found out that she was a Christian, I was like, oh my god, like you know, a person who's a Christian did not insert their own personal beliefs and value systems into the way they therapize their clients. You know, like she very objectively, you know, um, treated me as a client. You know, and I felt I felt that was really good, lah. You know, um, so yeah, I think my ideal therapist would really well. It is my current therapist, and at the same time, it's really just somebody who, regardless of their own beliefs and value systems, does not. You know, insert any of their own personal biasness and actually treats it as an objective case. You know, based on that person's background and belief systems as well. So, I mean, I've I've never experienced a bad therapist. So, I personally would not know if that has happened to anyone. But I wouldn't be surprised if it did, lah. Right? You know, there's all sorts of people out there. So, I think, yeah, that's why this therapist is an ideal therapist because he treated me objectively. You know, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to ask something. I think that is why, like, I also agree with my main the idea because I think she's religious as well. But like the way she treated me was also objective, like yeah. you said. So I think it's like the whole thing where like, no matter what, like you need to still feel safe with the therapist, yes. regardless of like what you know about them. Yeah. That makes them ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. What about you guys? I your ideal therapist. You oh. <laughs> Actually, I want to add something in. Actually, I did just remember I had a bad experience, but it wasn't intentional. So this was back in COVID. I was going through a lot of shit. Like I would, okay, I was very anxious to a point where I would just start crying and thinking about committing suicide. So I told my dad I wanted to go see a psychiatrist. Then, because I didn't really know the procedure, right? So he told me to go to the GP to get a, a letter of recommendation, then go to the psychiatrist. So I did that. And my GP, she's a family doctor. Um, she didn't want to give me a letter of recommendation. In fact, she started trying to therapize me, and she forced therapy on me when I wasn't ready to open up. And I think that kind of traumatized me because this was like three, four years ago, and I have not been back. So I think that was my bad experience because it was forced on me, and it was forced on me by somebody who is not um, certified to do so. Because the only thing that she told me was go paint on your wall. You know what kind of solution is that, right? So yeah, that was my bad experience, and I think also because, yeah, that was my very very first experience of so-called therapy. So that actually pushed me back from going to therapy for a year because somebody who's not certified tried to therapize me when they don't even know how to. Yeah, and when I wasn't ready. Hmm. Yes. Forced on you. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. What are some 
uh, coping strategies that can be observed and on effective. Alcoholism. Now it's an actual AA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, sorry. Can you say the question again? Since talking about mental health, like, what are some coping strategies like you found helpful or have you observed during your life? like when we're down? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Subjective. I mean, really like alcoholism lah. But this was back when I was in a really, really dark space. So one thing my therapist said to me when I was in a better space, so I, I wasn't seeing her when I was in a really, really dark spot. But what she said to me in one of the sessions was like, what is the point of a healthy coping mechanism if it doesn't work? So when I thought back, right, and really the coping mechanism was alcoholism. Every time I felt like shit, I would just drink till I felt happy. And I in turn conditioned myself to feel like shit and feel, feel suicidal for about three days every single time I drank. But at the same time, looking back, like, I don't blame myself because for me, that was the thing that was keeping me alive. Like, if it weren't for that, maybe I'd be dead by now, right? So, honestly, alcoholism. And, yeah, and even though it's unhealthy and all of that, like, I get it lah, you know. I, w- once I went through it, I, I really get it, you know, because, yeah, like I mentioned, maybe you wouldn't be alive if it weren't for that, right? And it was only when I went, when I got into a healthier space, a healthier mindset after using that as a short-term solution that I was like, okay, I'm going to go to therapy and I'm going to like... Basically, after that, I don't really think that I had any other coping mechanisms after that, maybe aside from nicotine, right? Um, But I think it was because I was very engrossed in trying to become better and making myself a better person internally so it can reflect externally. So maybe my coping mechanism was obsession with that. I don't know. So yeah. No? Alcohol, oh. Alcoholism? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was... Uh, I turned to alcoholism. Damn! To alcoholism. Yeah. AA! Say AA! Right? <laughs> I'd like to add on to the friends thing. Yeah. So, I think that's actually a really, really important part. So, to go back to the part where I said I would not be alive, is that, you know, every single... So, me and my friend during that time, we were both like suicidal as hell, right? And every time I would think of killing myself, I'll be like, Damn, my friend won't have any friend. Then when my friend thinks of killing herself, she'll be like, Damn, Zoe is not going to have any friend. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> like, yeah, that was the thing that kept the both of us alive. So we were both just constantly like thinking about that whenever we wanted to like kill ourselves. So I think friends is a really, really important thing. And the good thing is that the both me and her, we are both at a better space now together. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I don't think I really had any coping mechanisms. I just... I just straight up just get depressed and I just like get in my feelings for like very very long time like I would just be like depressed for uh, like months yeah and sometimes the occasional isolation I would mm-hmm. do like self-isolation mm-hmm. where like I don't really know how to explain how I'm feeling to people but then again I feel like I think like when like pre coming out I was like actually quite depressed and I think partially that had to do with the pandemic as well and that was when like I first like really confirmed that like I was a lesbian. So even though I was like happy, but like there's some like sadness to it as well because I'm just like, you know, I don't know like what it's gonna look like for me in the future. Even if I'm happy myself, I don't know like how how the world is gonna look like for me. How much do I have to like deal with and all that? So there's like the sadness that comes with it as well. So I think I was like depressed for like a yearish, a year or two, mm-hmm. and I was like. I mean, like, I, I don't think, like, I still hang out, you know, and everything. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's hard to tell. Maybe, maybe, maybe you could tell, but, like, like so literally, I, I was, like, depressed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> shit. Okay. Yeah, but, like, I was just very sad all the time, and uh, I was always in my feelings. I, I didn't think I would actually, like, get out of it. Like, I didn't think, like, I would be in the current state that I am right now. But honestly, yeah, like, going to therapy, like, really did help a lot because... Yeah, it didn't make like my problems any better, but like it changed my outlook on life. Like I think at the end of the day, like the only thing that became different was my outlook on life. And I think that affected everything around me, like in terms of how people interacted with me, how opportunities engage with me, like all these kind of things, or how I just look at things in general, like problems and all of that. Yeah, and I think friends too, like yeah, definitely mm. have friends, but I do think there was like beauty in like just sitting in my feelings though. Mm, like it, okay. it may have been a very long time. It may have felt like I wasn't going to get out of it, but like, but like that was like a time that I really 
did understand myself a lot more and I think I become I became clear because I think like sometimes when you when you like try to distract yourself like your feelings of sadness can get very foggy like you don't really you can't really identify like oh what what is it exactly that's making me sad because I think in the beginning stages that was how it was for me like I tried to distract myself a lot I tried to like just you know feel like I'm doing normal things and everything but I think it isn't really until like you sit down with it that you understand yeah. why you're actually sad about mm. things yeah yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> it's like alcohol, alcohol depression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 The goal is to establish that objectivity that you yeah. value yeah. a lot in your, mm-hmm. in your own therapist. Mm-hmm. So we need to, to achieve that, we need to confront our own biases first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do think like one thing to note also is that because like we are all Chinese, so mm. we yeah. are the most privileged group of the queer community. Because like you know, as Zoe mentioned just now, we're not under the Sharia law, yeah. and uh, our parents may not be entirely accepting. But I do still think that um, they are like this is the best it can get, mm. you know, for Malaysians in general. So I do think like a lot of like especially if you are like a trans person, or you are, you are like a Malay gay men then I think like a lot of things work against people yeah. like this group of people yeah. so yeah. yeah I'm not too sure if you guys are like doing more interviews but I think like our perspectives may not you know yes. encompass the answer as well yes so yeah 